Uh, thanks very much for this chance. I, I hope I, I, you, you can see the slides and can you see the we cursor see the move? Yes. Okay, yeah. great. So what I want to tell you about uh, uh, at the beginning are, are kind of a little bit of, of kind of a selective history of how people started to study um, the kind of biomaterial polymers and from a kind of a polymer physics background. And, uh, and it's based on trying to quantify the force extension curves of semi-flexible polymers and to see how much you can apply that very simple um, um, polymer-ish idea to biopolymers, which are not really polymers, they're gigantic macromolecules where each single subunit is itself a macromolecule. And so these much larger um, um, objects uh, might or might not be well fitted by different ideas coming from uh, um, sort of molecular polymer physics. And in particular, the challenge of applying these kinds of ideas to understand biological materials is to be able to know where their nonlinear responses come from, because these seem to be biologically really essential for their function. And the things I want to try to uh, focus on, both for this uh, early part and also for some of the tissue um, uh, mechanics parts, is to try to explain why these materials uh, shear stiffen, why their shear modulus increases as you increase their, their shear strain amplitude, and why they get stiffer when you stretch them, but why they get softer when you compress them. So there's this beautiful asymmetry between uniaxial stretch and compression that remains a bit of a challenge to try to understand. Okay, so let me um, start with uh, a reminder of rubber-like elasticity. Uh, which totally doesn't work uh, uh, for most kinds of things I'm going to show you. And, and what I want to remind you, or what I want to focus on a little bit, is the fact that entropic, is that rubber-like elasticity arises completely from entropy, right? That's the idea. And it works because thermal energy is pretty big on the scale of a, of a small, simple macromolecule. So again, to just kind of remind you or tune your intuition, uh, a unit of, of KBT is four times 10 to the minus 21st joules, kind of a worthless uh, um, uh, value for in, intuition. But, but since energy is work and works force times distance, that corresponds to four, approximately four piconewtons uh, delivered over a one nanometer scale. And that becomes pretty important on the scale of ma ma materials, especially biological things, because four piconewtons times nanometers is on the order of the kind of work that a molecular motor does. Uh, a few piconewtons uh, will move something a few nanometers. So thermal energy isn't tiny compared to a single motor. It's kind of in the same ballpark, smaller, but not a whole lot smaller. But if you think about what thermal energy does to a polymer, and so for example, that little black straight line is a um, cartoon of what a, uh, a very, very long polymer of polyethylene, you know, just something that's just a bunch of carbon-carbon bonds. Uh, if, you, if you were able to synthesize a 10 micron long strand of polyethylene and, and stretch it, and then allow thermal energy to do its work, that long line would collapse into that little squiggly dot on the right side. Uh, simply driven by uh, thermal energy. And the reason that works is because every bond in that, uh, uh, um, um, in that polymer has some flexibility. It's not exactly a universal joint, but the bonds are separated from each other by very small angstrom scale sizes. And from sort of classic uh, theory of polymers, if you take a uh, 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 a long line of, of random uh, steps, uh, you can show that the uh, radius of gyration or kind of the average end-to-end -end distance of the polymer, once it's been subjected to thermal writhing, uh, can be, uh, can be uh, equated to the number of links times the bond length, because the bond length is squared, because the bond length is really tiny here, uh, that overwhelms the, you know, the, the effect. So this very long extended thing will become tiny and squiggly and have massive amounts of contortions. And so by, by thinking about polymers that way, 
that thermal energy wants the um, uh, thing to randomize into a little squiggly form that's quite small, if you were to pull the ends of the polymer uh, to a different uh, distance, either stretch it or compress it, what you're doing is limiting the configurational states that will give you that end head distance. And so you're fighting against entropy. So that's pretty well explained. And you can uh, write down a force extension curve, uh, in this case on the bottom, where you can relate the force that it takes to achieve some change in the end to end distance of the polymer. Um, up in the numerator is thermal energy, that's what drives it. Down in the denominator is this nv squared uh, term. And so this kind of, and, we're, and note that this is a perfectly linear expression that force uh, uh, just depends on the uh, um, extension and it does, and it's the same whether the extension is positive or negative. And so this can be uh, uh, built into a kind of a network structure that tells you that the shear modulus of, an, of, a, of a network or a melt made out of these kinds of polymers will have a shear modulus that's, that's simply equal, almost equal to or proportional to thermal energy on the numerator and the mesh size in the denominator. And that works great for, for random coil polymers. And probably as, as soon as people started to understand the stiffness or, or the, so not the stiffness, but the structure of the cytoskeleton or the extracellular matrix, it's pretty easy to calculate the mesh size of these kinds of things. And if you plug in the mesh size of the cytoskeleton or the ECM into that uh, uh, G prime equals KT divided by mesh size, um, you, you get totally absurd uh, numbers. The, the actual stiffness of of these biological materials is orders of magnitude bigger than rubber-like elasticity tells you it should be. And presumably this has something to do with the stiffness of the polymer. And the other thing that, that is a, a really important kind of land, landmark in this, in this kind of study is this beautiful paper from uh, Eric Sockman's lab uh, uh, done by Josef Case and Helmut Stry, which I think is, is, is one, of the, one of the first, if not the first, um, demonstration that you can take a biopolymer, in this case, a fluorescently labeled actin filament, and look at its thermal gyrations, either in dilute solution, which is that picture on the left, or a single labeled filament um, enmeshed in a network of unlabeled neighbors around it. Uh, and you can already see from that that the amplitude of the undulations is different if a filament is is free in solution or stuck in a in a tube. And this was an important paper because it was the first kind of visual demonstration of reptation of a polymer uh, in a in a network of its uh, of its neighbors. Okay, so but and this also gives you a, a picture that that this kind of random coil polymer idea is probably not a good metaphor to think about uh, um, biological polymers like actin filaments and other things. Okay. Uh, but the, the other thing about this is, is that the reptation in a tube concept was a very good way to describe both the thermal undulations of the actin filament and its center of mass diffusion. So that um, the kind of molecular complexity of the actin filament or the fact that it has electrostatic charges on it, those kinds of, of chemical features can be to some extent just ignored. And you just think about this thing as some kind of semi-flexible polymer um, moving by thermal motions in the, in the surrounding network. And that's enough to be able to calculate diffusion constants and all kinds of stuff. Uh, all right. Uh, but again, it, 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 it also will, tell, will allow you from the thermal fluctuations to calculate the stiffness of the polymer. Why is it so straight? Okay. And and this is now uh, like a, a key feature of all the kind of extracellular matrix and cytoskeletal protein-based polymers. And on that same kind of you know, picture of an extended polymer compared to what it looks like in thermal motion, things like microtubules are, 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 are on this scale kind of infinitely stiff. So a 10 micron uh, microtubule, at least in vitro, is really straight. In the cell, if it's bent, it's bent not because of thermal motions, it's, it's bent because of some active uh, uh, motion. Actin filaments we've already looked at, and then this wonderful class of intermediate filaments uh, 
is still extended, but getting closer to kind of a random coilish thing. Um, and the, 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 you know, the metric of stiffness without actually measuring any kind of forces, you can compute approximately how stiff this material will be by calculating its persistence length. That is the distance over which a polymer uh, appears to be you know, moving in a straight line. So if you know the persistence length and, uh, uh, from, that you get from the structure of the filament and you assume that its contortion from a perfectly straight configuration is driven by thermal energy, you can calculate the bending modulus of that filament. And to, to a surprisingly large extent, you can ignore the chemistry of what these polymers are made out of. And again, just to put this thing in perspective, uh, things like an actin filament, um, uh, second down in this list, have pretty much the per same persistence length as a single walled nano uh, 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 carbon nanotube. Um, and they're pretty rigid objects, but they're not infinitely rigid. Whereas a microtubule is kind of getting there and compared to something like double-stranded DNA, which is in some sense a classic semi-flexible polymer, it's semi-flexible on a totally different length scale. It's much, much more flexible uh, than uh, an actin filament or even an intermediate filament, but it's much, much stiffer than polyethylene. Okay, so that's, that's kind of the idea. So now how do you model um, the, the um, uh, physical properties of an object like that that isn't just a random coil, but has some stiffness in it? And there are basically two different directions that people have taken. One is to start with that basic idea of taking a random walk with a particular uh, uh, um, uh, step size and, 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 a, and a totally random joint, and then start putting in some constraints to add in some stiffness uh, or some directional memory in the step that uh, the random walker takes, uh, you know, which is equivalent to putting in uh, bending energy in the polymer itself. And, and to do that, uh, or once you do that, you can again derive an expression for the end-to-end -end distance of these semi-flexible polymers uh, that is not simply n times uh, the step size squared. Uh, it has in it the contour length. L here is the contour length of the polymer, the totally stretched out length, uh, but also this important parameter, the, the persistence length of the polymer. Both of those two things conspire uh, to give you um, um, an estimate of the end to end distance that this polymer will achieve once it's subjected to thermal energy. All right, so that's the top thing. And again, by, by this uh, famous uh, work of Marco and Sigia um, um, uh, decades ago now, uh, you can also uh, drive a force extension curve or a, a relation between the force that it takes to change this resting end-to-end -end distance. And again, the expression is, is uh, kind of pretty. It's, not, it's, it, it's an analytical expression that, give, that, 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 that gives you the relation between changing the length and the force, as long as you know the persistence length and so forth. And so this model has been used extensively by people who do single molecule pulling of large uh, uh, biomolecules and an atomic force microscope, and, and it fits the force extension curves from experiments very nicely. But again, this model is based on taking a flexible polymer and making it less flexible. So the opposite approach was taken from Fred McIntosh and, and later uh, Joseph Case, Tom, Tom Lubensky, uh, Case Storm, and others uh, to come at the problem from the other point of view. To start with, an initially infinitely stiff uh, polymer, and then um, start putting in flexibility into that polymer. So you start with just a rigid rod and now relax the rigidness of it and start putting in undulations in the polymer. And once you do that, you can also compute the energy of a polymer that has a particular N10 distance uh, or a particular force applied to it. And that uh, uh, energy function has two important parameters, one kappa, 
the bending modulus of the filament, uh, and the bending modulus is related to the persistence length. Uh, the persistence length is just bending modulus divided by thermal energy. But if you if you uh, know the bending modulus of the uh, um, um, uh, 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 filament and F, the force that you're pulling on the end of the filament, you can calculate uh, um, uh, the energy in that object, and you can compute, therefore, the, um, uh, the two things. You can compute the, the length of the object uh, from its bending modulus and the thermal energy, but you can also compute the force that it would take to change the resting length of that polymer. So that's what's given in the, in the, in the lower uh, expression from a, uh, an early paper of Macintosh's. Uh, and what's in that expression, delta L is the change in the filament length that you achieve. And it's uh, um, related to a, a, a normalized uh, force, uh, 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 phi there is a, is a force that's made unitless by dividing it by the force that it would take to, for, to buckle the filament by buck, uh, Euler buckling instability. So again, you can, get, you can derive an expression uh, from this model for the change in length or the extension of a polymer as a function of the force that it takes to do it. And if you invert the graph of that basically, and what's shown on the, on the lower right is the force extension curve for one of these filaments that is semi-flexible, but pretty close to being fully extended. And it has this important feature that it shows that as you stretch it, you um, strongly drive up the force. So it takes much more force to stretch something than to compress it. And again, this isn't really buckling instability yet. It's just uh, 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 computing uh, how much force in this semi undulating material it would take to make those undulations get bigger and decrease the end-to-end uh, -end distance. That turns out not to be so hard but to stretch it out turns out to be harder. And again, this is still purely an entropic model. The entropy is modified by the fact that there's a bending modulus, but it's not just beam bending here, okay? All right, so, so th in this model, the filaments are themselves, each individual filament is intrinsically nonlinear, easier to compress than to stretch just from its configuration states. Okay, so what happens when you put these, this kind of model into a three-dimensional network? You take objects that are easier to compress than to stretch, but they're already almost stretched straight. Their, their contour length is not much different from the, the distance between crosslinks in the network. So if that's the, the the scenario, and, and that's the scenario that seems to be consistent with people's images of things like actin networks or cytoskeletal networks, then you can figure out what is the shear modulus of, an, of a network made out of this. And uh, uh, that's what's shown in the expression on the upper left from, again, from, from uh, Macintosh and Storm, uh, that again predicts now this time relatively accurately what the shear modulus should be for a network that has a particular mesh size, uh, again, C, but, but that, that expression now has in the numerator the bending stiffness of the filament. So if you know the bending stiffness of the filament and you know the mesh size, this Macintosh model will now tell you with some accuracy the magnitude of the shear modulus of this network. So it works from that point of view uh, even for linear de uh, 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 deformations. But what happens when you, when you make the shear deformations bigger and bigger? Eventually what will happen is depending on the orientation of the individual filament in this three-dimensional network or in a two-dimensional analog, if those filaments are aligned at uh, 45 degrees to the shear uh, uh, direction, then eventually some of them will become completely straightened out. And in principle, the force extension curve for that filament will go to infinity. It reaches, it, you've pulled out all the thermal slack and now you can't pull on it anymore unless there's some mechanical compliance in the filament. 
But filaments that are in the orthogonal direction, when you shear these networks, they just crumple. And they're easy to crumple uh, because uh, decreasing the end to end distance of them is easier to do than increasing the end to end distance. Uh, and, and so that gives that, that sort of difference, the difficulty of stretching a filament compared to the ease of compressing a filament gives rise to some really interesting effects, uh, which we'll see uh, in a minute. All right, so um, people started to look at that to see you know, how much does the shear modulus or this differential modulus change in a network of something like a cross-link actin net, uh, uh, network when you start um, deforming it. And one of the early uh, uh, experiments from this was from uh, Gardell and Waits and a bunch of uh, uh, luminaries um, who who did a, a really cool experiment in these in these uh, uh, cross-link networks. They took an actin network, measured its shear modulus by small amplitude oscillations, and then they applied increasing amounts of stress to that network. And so what you see in that little inset, the black line shows you the stress that they put on, on the network. They put on a little big step of stress and then held it there constantly and then wiggled around, you know, uh, around that increased stress. And they measure what the, the so-called K prime, a differential shear modulus, which is the shear modulus of that network in the statically deformed state. Uh, so superimposed on that static stress is a little wiggling stress from the amplitude or from the frequency and amplitude of that wiggling stress, you can calculate the shear modulus. And so the resulting strain is what you see in the red curve. And what's, what's, what's kind of wonderful about this is that for a while, the, uh, at very, very small stresses, the modulus stays approximately constant, but that quite abruptly it goes up and it goes up a lot. Um, uh, and it's again, it's a perfectly, uh, it's just a simple elastic response. It's completely reversible. Uh, the the uh, points in, in, in one color are, are for increasing uh, stresses and the points in the other color are, are in decreasing stresses. So we're not reorganizing the network. The structure isn't changing. It's just a response. And you can, and, and again, for something that was like a rubber-like elastomer, that thing would have just been flat. Uh, for the whole um, stiffness range. But these semi-flexible polymers stiffen a lot. And it's not special for actin. If you do a kind of a similar experiment, but now rather than changing the stress when you measure the shear modulus, you apply a constant, you apply an increasing strain, shear strain while you're measuring the modulus, everything that's semi-flexible including the cytoskeletal things like, like actin filaments and vimentin intermediate filaments and everything that's an extracellular fiber like fibrin or collagen, they all do the same thing. They are, they are quasi sort of linear elastic for very small strains, meaning less than a, a few percent, but that depending on the polymer and to some extent on the mesh size, as you increase the strain, they all get stiffer. And um, the amplitude of the shear modulus uh, depends on both the concentration of the polymer, which in this experiment is held constant, but it also depends from that expression we looked at before on the bending stiffness of the filament. So this kind of hierarchy of shear moduli from collagen on top to actin to fibrin to vimentin, that scales beautifully with the bending modulus of the filaments. Uh, and so does the strain at which the shear modulus starts to kick in. That increase in the stiffness occurs at smaller strains for stiffer polymers like collagen than it does for softer polymers like vimentin. And again, as a kind of a negative control, if you did this experiment with uh, polyacrylamide um, or flexible, any flexible polymer, uh, you would simply find a shear modulus whose magnitude does not depend on the shear strain, right? That's the that's because it's a linear elastic object. But everything that's biologically interesting isn't that; it's something else. Okay. Well, and, you have five minutes left. Perfect. Okay, so let's see the consequences of this. I'm going to skip over this. Oh, except I do want to remind you of one other thing. 
the same years that those uh, uh, experiments were done and modeled by this kind of semi-flexible picture of Macintosh, there's this really important paper from Ankh and van der Giesen, who pointed out that you could get the same effect from stiff polymers that were themselves intrinsically linear. So the filament does not have to be nonlinear. It can be, it can have a totally linear uh, uh, response. It's just that as you deform networks that are sparsely connected by these uh, 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 of these filaments, as you deform the network, the deformation modes of the filaments switch from bending, which is relatively soft at small deformations, until the filaments align in the shear direction, and then they can't bend anymore, and they have to stretch, and stretch is much stiffer. So this switch from bending to stretching also will account for this. Okay, so there are several consequences of this nonlinearity, which I'll quickly gloss over. One is that when you do an oscillatory measurement on actin or something like that, if you apply a sinusoidal strain in the top part, you get a periodic stress, but the stress isn't a sinusoid. It's this funny shaped thing because the stress strain curve isn't linear. But surprisingly, you also get a very strong um, effect in the orthogonal direction. Every time you deform one of these networks in shear, the, uh, the, the sample pulls down. And it pulls down about the same order of magnitude of, of stress with a frequency doubling, because it doesn't matter whether you torque to the right or to the left, uh, um, the normal force is always um, going to respond to that. And so you get this very large so-called negative uh, pointing effect or negative normal stress, which is the opposite of what random coil polymers or things like wire or metal do. If you torque them, they tend to get longer. If you torque an actin thing, you, it gets shorter. And that has some, and again, it's not special for actin, it's, it's generic for anything that's semi-flexible. Uh, but And as soon as you do the same experiment for something like polyacrylamide, the normal force shown in those triangles isn't, doesn't become negative, it becomes um, very small, but slightly positive at big strains. Okay, so let me show you the, the one last example of, 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 of an interesting effect that these guys have. What happens if, because the, the sample is a, wanting to pull down, what happens if you push it down yourself and then measure the shear modulus? What happens is that the, the shear modulus goes down for these networks when you compress them. And again, it's generic. It happens for collagen, it happens for fiber, it happens for everything. But interestingly enough, if you stretch it, it gets stiff. And the reason it gets stiff, according to, to Fred, is that um, you develop these force chains in the vertical direction that be, be, that be, be, that the more you stretch it, the more prominent they become and the larger that feeds into the shear modulus. Okay, one other thing I wanna point out for these um, uh, curious objects is that these networks also have a, a, a interesting mismatch between their apparent Young's modulus and shear modulus. Ordinarily, you'd think that for a simple elastic continuum, those two things are easily related. But if you take, for example, on the, on the left, a fibrin gel and measure its axial stress as a function of axial strain. So negative axial strains, compression, positive stretch. If you just looked at the Young's modulus as the slope of that axial stress, the strain curve, you get two Young's moduli. You get a very weak one in compression and a very stiff one in stretch. But those two things, those two plots are pretty linear. So you just get a constant um, Young's modulus in compression, constant one in, in, in extension. They just don't, they're not the same number, but they're constant. Uh, but whereas in contrast, the shear modulus shown in red is continuously changing over this whole range of shear strain. So it's a kind of a warning that if you know one quantity, from a measurement, you don't necessarily know the other quantity the way you might for a polymer melt. All right, and again, this can be explained from this uh, su surprisingly um, uh, nice, uh, simple model of, of uh, uh, Macintosh, which I just referred to you here. Okay, so let me finish here that that the, the, the thing about these biopolymer networks is that these fibrous networks stiffen with increasing shear and they develop a negative that is contractile normal stress. 
And the fiber networks, fibrous networks also stiffen with uniaxial stretch, but they do the opposite. They soften with compression. And these nonlinear effects depend on the soft response of a semi-flexible polymer to compression that, that polymers that are intrinsically easier to compress than stretch uh, automatically give you this. Uh, but even for stiff linear uh, uh, elastic objects that are sparsely connected, you can get the same effect by this mismatch between uh, bending and stretching modes. Okay, so let me stop there. Thank you, Paul, for a wonderful talk. So we will take a few questions and then take the rest of the questions after your second talk. So Kai asks, can the approaches of Marco Sigia and Macintosh et al. be reconciled with each other? Yeah, so they, they, I think they can, and I don't know how much they have been pushed like towards the middle ground. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, they, they do have the same limits. They both tell you that force goes to infinity when you've, when you've pulled the end-to-end uh, um, uh, um, -end distance to the uh, um, contour length. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're consistent in that way. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's, it's, it, it's un, I, I, at least to me, it's unclear which model you want to use for filaments that are kind of in the middle. So things like intermediate filaments right. are, are um, maybe not stiff enough for the Macintosh model, or, or, and they may be better, better fit by Marco and Sigia, but so it's, 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 it's a little bit unclear what's in the middle, at least to me, maybe the, I'm sure theory people may understand it much better. Thank you, Paul. And then we'll, uh, uh, I'll ask you one more question now. So this is from Rubain Bruinsma, and the question is, how does the compressional modulus compare to the shear modulus? Yeah, so typically the compressional modulus is is much smaller than the shear modulus. Even when the shear modulus goes down, it's, um, I, I think in all the experiments we have done, um, it is the, the compressional modulus is at least sort of a factor of five-ish or so smaller than the shear modulus, even in the lowest point. And one thing I, I should point out it, that the shear modulus goes down with compression with uniaxial compression only to a point, if we keep squeezing it, the shear modules will rise again. Uh, be, and, 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 and at least in my kind of uh, uh, naive uh, picture, I, 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 you might think of it as when you start compressing, you start buckling some filaments and eventually you'll buckle everything that's in the right orientation to buckle. And if you keep squeezing it, then you just start stretching filaments. Um, but, uh, uh, but the, but oddly enough, the, the, the apparent Young's modulus doesn't respond to that in the same way that the shear modulus is, but I believe it's always smaller than the shear modulus. Thank you, Paul. So we will take the remaining questions at the end of, yeah. you know, the second talk during the live Q and A. So thank you, Paul, again, for a great tutorial. So we can, uh, I, I mean, you know, maybe we can move on to your research talk now. 